Amen. Sing loud, Bob. Yeah, sing loud. He's good at the house tonight. Okay. We praise him. We've had a little technical difficulty, but God is still on the throne. And here we are. All our mics are working. We're ready to go. There are no technical difficulties in heaven. And we'll talk a little bit about what's coming on the world, the second coming of the Lord Jesus. So stay tuned. Enjoy with us as we worship. But you can tell my voice is a little out, so help, help, help us sing tonight. Let's make a joyful noise to the Lord. He is good. He is wonderful. Bless you, Jesus. Yes, he is. He's wonderful. <laughs> Yeah. 
Yes, amen. When the Lord gets ready, He's not going to ask you if you're ready. He's, they're just going to blow that trumpet and we're gone. That's right. We're gone. That's right. You know, we won't have no time to get ready or anything. Either you're ready and you're gone, you're caught up, or you're left behind. That's right. And, and I believe that everybody in here has their reservation. Amen. It's made things right. And when that trumpet blows, we'll just all go up together. Amen. Amen. In the meantime, let's lead on him. Yes, we do. The, Lord, the Lord's truly good, isn't he? He is. You know? Uh, I, I just can't get over how the Lord... It seems like the Lord delights in blessing me at times. Yes, I went through some heavy, heavy storms in my life. Many, many a time I said, God, if you don't help me, I'm not going to make it. Well, guess what? I'm here, Woody. That's right. I'm here. And, you know... I, Sometimes at home, I don't have to tell you that I walk all over my house. <laughs> it may not be much longer and I have to replace my carpet <laughs> because I just walk all over my house and I'm just amazed the way the Lord blesses me. I think he takes delight in blessing me and it's all because I love him so. I get up in the morning and I say, God, I love you and I begin to praise the Lord. And you know, I praise my Savior all the day long. Yeah, track one, track one. <laughs> Across the sea. 
We will say again, there are many good Christian folks that believe a little differently than we do. And uh, we, we study the scriptures and sometimes come to different conclusions and we understand it. But we want to teach what we believe but when the Lord Jesus comes back, what's going to happen. So let's read this verse and then we'll dig in from, from there. And I saw thrones and they sat on them and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their foreheads or their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you, dear God. You reign. And we thank you, Lord, tonight that your word is true. Every bit of it has happened, is happening, or will happen. And we pray that that be a firm fact in our hearts as we leave this place, that we will trust what you say and believe it and apply it to our lives. We ask this in Jesus' name. Jesus reigns. He is awesome. And I, I, I thought tonight, I don't have a, a special one for, to bring somebody up tonight. So sorry, Molly. Sorry to anybody else. Not tonight for, the, for this one. But we do want to encourage us that God is on the throne. And sometimes we have we need to have a response to that. That's what we're, we're looking to encourage us with tonight. When I was in kindergarten, I went to kindergarten here in Russellville, the Crittenden Drive Church of Christ. And at that school, I remember very early on in the year, I just, of course, I, I, that was my first experience with school, I saw a fairly tall man. He was, I believe, the minister of that church. He was also the principal. He carried a big paddle, right? He showed those students all his paddle. And I, don't, I can't describe to you in words probably adequately what kind of fear and what kind of awe that would instill in a child to know. I, you know, when he would go walking down the hall, I'd probably look kind of the other way and try to hide myself. Maybe to, see, maybe to make sure he wouldn't be, be looking at me, looking my direction. If you understand what I'm saying here, sometimes that feeling, it, it, it's, it can be unpleasant. But something of that, something of that needs to be with us as we have to turn our thoughts toward Jesus Christ as King. He's more powerful than we could ever know when he reigns, and he is coming to this earth. And so there is, there does need to be a little bit of all, because he is bringing, as we're going to talk about in weeks to come, judgment with him. We'll talk about the judgments, uh, and we'll be sharing this again. But for us, we do have a sheet here, and I'm going to read this from our uh, statement of fact. And again, as we've said, we're, you're welcome to uh, read along with uh, with me up here as I read. Well, it'll certainly sound better than my voice tonight. So it says this on number 14. We believe in the millennial reign of Christ. When Jesus returns with his saints at his second coming and begins his benevolent rule over earth for 1,000 years, this millennial reign will bring the salvation of national Israel and the establishment of universal peace. Amen. Yes. Amen. All right. I want to read something else that the Assemblies of God, our church, wrote on this. It's not on that sheet, but it goes along with this. The second coming of Christ includes the rapture of the saints. We talked about that last week in greater detail, which is our blessed hope, followed by the visible return of Christ with his saints to reign on the earth for 1,000 years. So there's a lot to unpack there, and so this is the brief version. People have written many books on this. As you may know, there's books that we probably could talk here for a long time, but we'll give the brief version so, I want to look at Zechariah chapter 14, verse 5. Zechariah 14, verse 5. So this fundamental truth, if you're familiar with anything about the end times, we talk about what's called the tribulation, or a, and or the great tribulation is come, it comes up. That is particularly not mentioned in the truth. It's a little vague how we put it intentionally so, so the folks that have a little different belief, it doesn't necessarily contradict. But this is in the last days. Zechariah 14 is a great place that will talk about the return of the Lord Jesus. We do want to um, mention this here for us. Let's read. Then you shall flee through my mountain valley, for the mountain valley shall reach to Ezel. Yes, you shall flee as you fled from the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. Thus the Lord by God will come, and all the saints with you. In that day, as we read in Revelation, as we could spend a lot of time reading in Revelation, there will be great trouble that comes on the earth. 
And we see a little bit of that here, the fleeing and running around. It's like if anybody has ever seen one of the umpteen disaster movies that they make, uh, you can kind of get a, just a little bit of a glimmer that uh, probably even get close to scratch the surface of what will be happening in those days during the Great Tribulation period. But uh, it is a fearful time that comes on the earth as God judges the earth and everything that's going on. So I do want to just say this about the tribulation. We believe, from the, again, since the truth doesn't go this direction, uh, it, we're not going to talk as much about this, but I do believe in the great tribulation the period's coming up. The book of Daniel talks about it being a seven-year period, and it'll, and it'll be a covenant that's made with Israel and broken in that time frame. And so we have a split into to two periods of three and a half years. Um, and so you have several different things that are going on on several sides. But I just want to say this as far as applying it to us tonight. I can think of a few worse things than the fear that's going to be on the earth in those days, the terror that's there because of all the, 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 the judgment and the, the things that are loose. And so it's best to make it right with God now. Can I get an amen to that? Amen. It's best to make it right with God now because we believe, as we said last time, that those who are right with the Lord will be spared this great tribulation. So let's give it give it to him. If we are, I, and I probably have spent some sleepless hours, maybe you have too, worried about what's coming on the earth, the tribulation. Maybe the tribulation that's already here worries you too. But Lord, help us not to give in to fear. Amen. Because we understand that the awe and reverence for God is important, but if we have that spirit of fear, it will bind us down. And that's what could happen, and that's what will happen during the Great Tribulation. One of the beautiful things about Revelation and all the teaching on the end times is that much of the scriptures we learn from the past, like you read about a judge or a king or what Israel did, we can learn, right? In this case, you actually have the ability to see the future and bring lessons to today. Which is, it's, if you understand what I'm saying, we can take truths that are going to be very true then and apply them to us today. And what am I saying to us? That fear doesn't need to be us. We are to be confident, to be brave, because he has taken us. And as we're going to talk about it in a little bit after this verse, he's coming back physically on this earth to rule and reign. And we look forward to that day. And so Lord, help us not to give in to that, because guess what it says there? My God will come, and guess who's coming with him? Oh, the, yeah. saints. Yes. the saints are coming with him. All of us are going to be right there with him. Nothing to be afraid of. We have all, For us as believers, we, this is, again, part of our hope. We will rule and reign with him, coming right back there with him. So the tribulation is there, yes, but we don't want to give in to fear. And so we believe at the end of this period, you know, the battle of of Armageddon, the different things that go on, the Lord Jesus is going to come back. And so, will you go to the next verse, please? If it's what I think it is, we do want to mention this. Because it is good to have a picture of Jesus, because many people picture Jesus in different ways, but we forget this one sometimes. Now, I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. Jesus here is depicted as the judge and warrior. You serve a strong God. You know that. You have a strong Savior in your corner. And that's what we're mentioning. That's where we're going tonight with some of this. As he's returning to earth, he shows his strength. And, of course, he all, we, we understand that our God and our Savior is love. He shows that love to, to us in many ways. But here he also shows us his strength and how he is going to judge the earth in power. And no one is going to stop him. That's right. No one's going to stop Amen. Jesus. And no one, and I do want to posit this, if no one's stopping him then, no one's stopping him today either. Amen? Amen. What he wants to do, he's going to do. I'm confident of that in us and through us. All right. And so as he comes back to earth, we want to talk just a little bit of Revelation 20. We want to go there. The later rain is talked about here. Uh, and it's greatest detail and specifics. And... Revelation chapter 20, verses 1 through 6. It says, Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up, 
and set a seal on him so that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. But after these things, he must be released for a little while. Verse 4. And I saw thrones, and they that sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, and who would not worship the beast or his image, and had not received the mark on their foreheads or on their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. But the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he who has part of the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and with Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. Amen. So there's a lot there that we can dig in and talk, but talk about for a while. So what's happening here? We believe that literally Jesus Christ is going to return to earth. He will physically be here. That we believe that literally he will rule here for a period of 1,000 years. Thank you, brother. I appreciate that. And as he rules for 1,000 years, he will bring with him many, many good things and also us as a part of that process. And we're going to be a part of that. It mentions in greater detail those who have given their lives, but I believe we're in that number as well. I believe we're, we're in that number with him judging and reigning for that 1,000 years. And so, but it particularly wants to note those who are persecuted. So I just, I do want to say this. There's a particular type of persecution that they're talking about now. But if we go through it for the Lord Jesus, he never forgets. He always will reward those. If you're going through it right now for the Lord Jesus, he knows. Amen? He knows what you're going through. And, it, and this is, again, proof of that. He, not one person that's been, been treated unfairly for him is not forgotten by him, and he will make it right. All right. So I do want to talk a little bit. We do need a little teaching here because there are different ways that folks believe this. And so we do want to talk just for a moment about that. So now through history of the, the, of the church, there's been different ways that people look at the thousand years of the millennium. And so uh, some folks, uh, just to quickly sum it up, they're called post-millennialists. And that, I just say that term to say this. They're folks that generally believe that we make the millennium down here by doing good enough good deeds. So in other words, well, if we do enough good deeds, more and more good things will happen, more and more people will get saved, and we make the thousand years basically come up, and then at that point, Christ will return. So in other words, we're kind of making the thousand years happen down here is what they're saying. There's another group called amillennialists who do believe something a little different but fairly similar that everything that's said about the millennium is pretty much all spiritual and symbolic. And some of the things that are talked about for the millennium will be dealt with in heaven. And that's where the those come down. So we have those two views, which sound a little bit different, but they're a lot the same. They basically don't believe that literally this will happen. And so that I would just say, if you look and read this passage, it's pretty clear. He says over and over, a thousand years, a thousand years. And when I read in the Old Testament prophets, and even in, in some things about the New Testament, there's just a preponderance of weight of Scripture that, that comes to us. We call, if you believe what we're talking about, you're called a premillennialist. In other words, you believe that the millennium is a literal thing that's going to happen. And so our understanding of the Scriptures, that they are true, and our understanding that we, we take the Scriptures weighted together, there's a lot that talks about this period of time that can't really seem to, it doesn't really seem to be heaven. It seems to be something on this earth that the world will make. Why would the Lord do that? We'll talk about that in a minute. But it seems literal that this is what's going to happen. And so, and by the way, experience doesn't show us these either because the world is still a pretty rough place even after thousands of years. It's, it's not the millennium now, in other words, is what I'm trying to say. This is not the millennium. I feel very confident of that. We still see a very much fallen world and a world that's, that's not just kind of moving towards utopia. That's not... That's almost what some folks teach. And they love the Lord. I'm not saying they don't, but that's, that's not what we see in the scriptures. So, okay. So we believe that it literally will happen. Well, what does happen? In verses 1 through 3 in Revelation, we read that the devil is bound. Hallelujah. Amen. We have that privilege and power now. We realize he, he still fights. He fights hard. But I'm thankful that the temptations that, that are faced on this earth will finally come to a stop during this period. And so if you're battling temptation, and we know a lot of people are, maybe someone that's watching out there or here, we battle that temptation from the enemy, take heart. 
Take heart. We see here our God wins. Amen. Amen. Our God wins. Temptation is victory. There's victory over. Hang in there. Also this, verses 4 through 6, if you look there, the saints will reign on the earth with people. There apparently will be people still left on this earth after all that happens in the tribulation. We, uh, a lot of it will seem to be with the, the nation of Israel. We'll talk about that in a minute. But there will be people on this earth and the, the saints will reign. And so and Paul wrote that uh, we will even judge angels, the Bible says. And one thing I want to say is that if we're part of this period and helping to judge all that's going on, Take confidence he can use us here. Amen? Amen. So in other words, if he could use me there, he could also use me here to make decisions. Sometimes we kind of get, oh, I can't do that. The Lord can help us to make the, if we're in the valley of decision and we needed that judgment, today he is God for you and me to make that judgment. So I want to encourage us with that as well. But in that day, in that day, there will be a, 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 a judgment that the Lord will give to his people, and especially those martyrs and bitches here in particular. And it mentions here also, the second death has no power. Hallelujah. The second death has no power. We, we, don't, we don't have to worry about hell. Hell is far away, never to be ours. And I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful for that. The second death has no power with those who love the Lord. And one other thing it mentions here in verse 6, it's very neat. It says that for us priests, they will be priests of God and Christ. And so many people like to leave the religious work, if you will, to preachers or others. But I want to say this, kind of going along with what I'm saying. I believe he's called us to be kings and priests, the Bible Amen. says. He's called us to do that work. And so what do I mean by that? There's a lot of people in the world that need you to be their priest, not in the literal sense that you might think what I'm saying. But what does a priest do? A priest takes the concerns of the people and brings it to God, right? There's a lot of people, a lot of people that need you to do that for them. Amen. They got some needs. And we're going to do that then. We need it now, too. We need some priests out there, some people that are prayer warriors, some people that are standing in the gap, bringing those concerns, taking the concern. You know, the priest would take the offering and burn it up as a memorial before God. We need some people that will send some prayers and memorials before God and stand in the gap. Amen. We do. We need that. And so for us, I remind us that God has called us to be people who are confident in what their God has given them to do. All right? I want to mention a couple other things about what the fundamental truth says about the, uh, the millennium. And so Zephaniah 3.20, a little bit of this. We believe that God will use this time, the, the tribulation, and of course the millennium, this particular we're talking about is a working for the nation of Israel. Way back in Genesis chapter 12, God gave Abraham and corresponding now through the, the patriarchs promises. And the Bible is very clear. God does not forget his promises. And the promises to Abraham dealt with the seed, the land, and the nations. And we believe that in this time that what the Lord promised, he did bring things to pass, but there will be an ultimate fulfillment in this millennium time that we're talking about. The Lord will still take care of national Israel, the Jewish people. Zephaniah 3.20, at that time I will bring you back. Even at the time I gather you, for I will give you fame and praise among all the peoples of the earth when I return your captives before your eyes, says the Lord. So what's the Lord doing here? I remind us that God keeps his covenant, and he brings his, the, the people of Israel whole. In other words, he brings them to their land. That's already happened. We see that after 1948 when the nation of Israel was founded. A lot of, after the Holocaust, after many things in the nations like Russia where Jews were persecuted, a lot of Jews came to Palestine, to Israel, and, and made that a state. So that's happened, but we believe that this last time that this will happen in an even greater fulfillment during this period. And so what's this about here? I do... Appreciate Christmas songs. And one of the Christmas songs says this, joy to the world. What does it say here? I'm going to give you fame and praise above all the earth. We're going to look and see what God has done through all. You remember Abraham lived, you know, 4,000 years ago. And all the way back there, God is keeping his promises to Abraham. So we look and say, wow, look what the Lord has done. 
We're all going to look the rest of us and see what God is doing with the Jewish people. Look what the Lord has done. And so I, I, I reminded that there is great joy that comes as we see God fulfilling his promises. And in Romans chapter 11, and verses 26 and 27, there is a, the, the land, remember, the pro, there are promises to Abraham concerning the land, and he's going to bring them back. But it says also, and so also all Israel will be saved. It is as written, the deliverer will come out of Zion, and he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. That's Jesus. But this is my covenant with him when I take away their sins. I'm glad God provides physically, but I'm sure glad he provides spiritually. Amen. He will work in the nation of Israel, even though many of them don't know him now. Many, many Jewish folks, atheists, agnostics, what, what you have. But I'm thankful he hasn't forgotten his people and still loves them and will minister to them. In this day, this day we're talking about here at the end, he's going to minister to them spiritually. I'm thankful for that. So the Lord works in his saving for Israel. And we'll mention one other thing in our last set of verses, Isaiah chapter 11, verses 8 and 9. The truth says there will be a salvation for national Israel and also universal peace. Universal peace. I love these verses. You probably, you ever heard of old Elvis saying, there will be peace in the valley. This is in this song. The nursing child shall play by the cobra's hole and, put the, and the weed child shall put his hand in the viper's den. Eleven died. And this is just a sampling. They shall not hurt nor destroy in my holy mountain. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Amen. I'm thankful and I, I, I rejoice tonight that the Lord brings his peace. Even above nature, it seems like there's a peace that comes that's not there now. And I'm grateful that he brings that healing. Because you see, when Adam sinned, it caused great difficulty on the earth for us and also the earth out there, right? All the, the things now, there's some travail, as they call it, some difficulty. But God brings healing to that. So in other words, what am I saying? You know, God could just go ahead and make the new heavens and the new earth. I mean, as we said, some people teach that. But it doesn't seem the scriptures teach that. It seems the scriptures teach that the Lord is going to work here first before he makes the new heavens and the new earth. Why? Why not just start off heaven now? I believe it's for that same reason that we, we talked a little bit about it and alluded to. It's for his praise. You know, God can start over with us too, right? We're gone. Let's have some new people that will do it right this time. Let's start over. He didn't do that, did he? He works with us as broken vessels and saves us and redeems us and makes us whole, builds us up. You know, we're, we're uh, sanctified. We're working toward uh, him. And, and, I, and what I mean by that is to say God chooses to change us. He will change the earth back in the same way to a more perfect state of glory. And it will all be for his praise. God is good at fixing broken things. He will then, and guess what? He does today too. While there's still time before all this happens. And you and I will see these miracles, the miracles of nature, miracles of, in people's hearts, and we'll praise God. It's a way he brings praise to himself by this thousand years. So let me just wind it down with this. So when I met my wife, my, my lovely wife, if you're watching, Mika, I love you. I didn't have the relationship with my wife that I ultimately have now. That didn't really happen. So when I first remember her coming around, she was she would come to the church, and sometimes there would be people, and sometimes there wouldn't. And she, as I've said, she worked with the kids. She was a kids teacher, and I was more of like the youth. I did the youth, the old, the middle school, and high schoolers, college. I worked with that group. But she wanted to work with me, and she would come, and she would talk. And so, as you know, my wife's a little bit on the shorter side. So she's always liked to wear big high heels. And so I could tell, I could hear the door open outside. I could tell, clack, 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 clack. guess who's coming? And they're in her little high heel shoes. Oh, it's my wife. No, oh, no, she's coming again. I've got to, you know, of course I would date her at the time. It's like, and she she would want to talk. I'd like, oh, I got so much to do. But we, but we would talk and we would have we'd have a really good time. And so if you're watching this, it, it didn't always say it turned out good spending time with her. So don't don't get me wrong here. <laughs> So, but the thing is, it had to grow, right? The relationship had to grow with us. She would try to talk me into doing stuff, too. It's like, oh, I don't have time. Oh, yes, you do. And, of course, my wife, I got talked into. And we, we would have joint stuff with the kids and the youth, and it was good. It turned out fine. But I, she had to volunteer because she wouldn't, take, she wouldn't take that no for an answer. And so what am I saying here? What am I saying? Sometimes things have to build. <laughs> 
And so, like we said, just as we learn from the past through much of the scriptures, we learn from the future in this. Our walk with God is where it is now. And if we see where it is now, sometimes we might be like, oh, no, where's, the, what's this going? where's this going, God? I want to challenge you. It's going someplace, right? If you stick with God, just like my relationship with my wife, it took, as you may know, many years to develop and work. It will take sometimes time for the Lord to do what he's doing. But it will happen. It will happen. We don't see, maybe we look at this and we don't see, how is this even possible for the Lord to remake things as messed up as they are now? He does it. It's already guaranteed in his word. We believe him. And we believe that he is building up to something amazing. And his return is going to be sure and his rule is going to be sure. And so trust him tonight. We will see so much more as we trust him. Amen. So if I could just invite whoever could play for us here. I do want to pray for us. we come to the, the end, we do remind us that he could come tonight. All this process could be started very quickly. The Bible makes it clear, if you read some of those scriptures, it makes it clear that when things get started, they're going to get started. It's going to, it's going to happen. Right. It's going to come. And it's not going to delay. The time to make things right is now with Jesus. To know that you're born again. To know that you're right with him. To pray for those that are not right with him. And to take heart if you're discouraged about the troubles that are here or the troubles that could possibly come in the future. He's got it. He's got it all. I want to pray for us. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray that, Lord, you work at any of us, dear Lord, that need to make it right with you. That, Lord, we will not delay because you are coming to judge. You are coming, dear God, with your saints on thrones. And, Lord, we had best be ready. And I pray, dear God, that in everything, dear God, for those that don't know you, they make it right now. That they make it right. And Lord, I do pray for this as well, dear Lord, for any that are struggling with fear tonight. It's not really at all of you, dear God. It's, it's more of a fear. I just pray, dear God, that if they're afraid about whatever's coming, If any are sick, dear God, you've got that in your hands. If any, dear God, are discouraged, seeing no hope, you've got that too, dear God. And our hope is sure. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Lord, I just pray for those that are looking to see more, dear God. We will see it in that day, Lord, but in this day, pray you show yourself to be the strong king ruler that you are and that you will make a way where there seems to be no way. Show yourself strong in the lives, dear God, that you are the one riding on that horse, faithful and true, not just then, but today and now for those needs that are needed, that everyone will take heart and be lifted towards you, dear God. And we love you for it, Jesus. Not only are you that strong one, but just like they're playing, you are softly and tenderly calling to that one tonight that needs it. Do it, Lord, for your sake. Do it, Lord, for your sake. In Jesus' name. For every need that's out there, dear God, we pray a miracle and great deliverance, dear God, so that you might be praised, just as you'll be praised. When the lion shall lie down with the lamb, you tonight, dear God, for all you're going to be doing in our lives, the miracles and great things. And we pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. Pray God's blessings for you and look forward to seeing you again soon.